So let me just tell you a little bit about, about who you can expect um, in the next conversation. I'm pleased to introduce the next session, a uh, fireside chat presented by Pluralsight. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, to the stage, Nick Sinai, who is the Senior Advisor at Insight Partners and former U.S. Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the Obama Administration. And he's going to be in conversation with James Hansen, who is Government Executive uh, Media Group's Vice President, and he's also the publisher of NextGov. So I think we're good, ready to go here. I'm just going to turn it over to James. That's a hard group to follow right there. It is. That's a lot of smarts in... Uh on this stage. Um, Nick, thank you for joining us. Uh, why don't you just kick things off with, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Insight and your role and really your experience with emerging technologies. Sure thing. Uh, great to be here. Great to see a lot of familiar faces. So Insight is a large venture capital and growth investor firm. All we invest in is software. Uh, and that those are companies that have found product market fit, that are winning in the marketplace, usually winning with tier one commercial customers, uh, and starting to scale. And so that's when Insight comes and invests uh, 20, 50, 100 million dollars and really helps them go global, helps them come into the public sector, uh, uh, a number of, uh, you know, help, helps add additional capabilities. The thing that I, I want to stress is that we're really investing in companies that are enterprise grade and are appropriate for the complexities of the federal mission. Uh, I did earlier stage venture capital um, earlier in my career before public service. And so I, I love two guys and a dog. It's such a cool thing. Um, it's not always right for the kinds of uh, applications and, and use cases in, in federal government, especially in IT. Mm -hmm. You know, on the R&D side, it's absolutely appropriate. Uh, and we commercialize a lot of great tech coming out of the, the federal labs. Uh, but for the enterprise use cases, uh, what we really want are venture-backed companies that are growing fast, uh, that are continuing to innovate on the product side, um, and in fact, uh, two of the four sponsors here are inside-backed comp companies, so Pluralsight and uh, Hootsuite, uh, two fantastic companies. And it's these kinds of companies that continue to innovate uh, month after month, year after year, um, and that's, that's really what we need in, in the public sector. So we've obviously we've heard a lot today about uh, how emerging technologies can really change the way government operates, uh, deliver services to its citizens, supports veterans, um, and just help uh, advance the mission. With that, there are obviously we've heard today there are challenges and uh, there's some a lot of planning that goes into that and nuances from data to security to legal, which we just heard about. And, and some of the laws around data. Um, can you tell us, you know, where to start? Like, where's a great place to start? We've heard, obviously, the last panel, there was a lot of data is, is essentially the starting point, really, for a lot of AI applications. But just emerging technologies in general uh, and disruptive technologies. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, starting with the end user, starting what problem you're trying to solve. And I think that's, that's oftentimes the hardest because we can get, and I think the previous panel did a really nice job of, of, of talking about how that, that's in, in their domains in AI, mm -hmm. that's how they're thinking about the, the problem set as well. Because we can get, we can jump right into a bunch of sexy technology terms. And uh, I mean, take something like robotic process automation, robots, right? Sounds really cool. What are you really doing? You're scripting two legacy technologies. Now that's super important and valuable, right? Because you are freeing up federal workers to do higher value work. So I think RPA is totally appropriate, relevant. We have a couple companies that we've made investments in. So RPA totally works. Uh, but if we start with a, you know, robots and, and that kind of thing, that's, that's not the way. Let's start with what, are we, what problems are we trying to solve for the veteran, for the warfighter, for the student, uh, um, for those in need, whatever, and then work backwards. And so, you, you know, any agency has a good sense of mission. The trick is to kind of prioritize uh, what is going to kind of move the needle with the most folks externally or internally uh, and, and then kind of break it down into how can you uh, try things and then scale from there. So I really liked what the past panel was talking about in terms of how do you prototype with end users, whether they're uh, customers or citizens of an agency or whether they're, they're you know, internal employees or operators uh, in, inside the DOD. Is there best practices for being able to, to 
start with that mission and then start with the quote unquote low hanging fruit and then scale up? Do you have examples of agencies or use cases that you've worked with that start there? I know the gentleman from, um, I think it was DLA was saying, you know, his example was start with an office of, you know, 50 employees and then and then start learning best practices from there. Do you have uh, some examples? Or? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, there's, there's a lot of examples. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, you know, this has got started in the past administration and this current administration has, has continued it. Uh, and it's a good example of a group uh, set up to try and buy technology and help it scale. And so there's examples, uh, I mean, the Air Force, for example, uh, the CTO of the Air Force is in the front row, so I have to. Hi, Frank. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a good example of, of here's a unit that was designed to try and buy and they, they have done that in, 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 in close partnership with uh, the CTO and finding technologies that can actually scale in an enterprise wide. Um, funny enough, it's actually the group that incubated Kessel Run, which is, is a uh, kind of flagship unit uh, for, for um, developing applications. Uh, quickly and deploying them out to the field. And so there, it's both an example of a unit that's designed to try and buy technology, as well as a, a group that innovated um, and, and actually founded other important units inside the Air Force. And how do, we, how do organizations keep pace with the advancement or self acceleration of some of these emerging technologies? I mean, whether it's from, you know, cloud started like 10 years ago and now we're actually like smartly uh, going to uh, market and implementing cloud, big data analytics is now you know transforming to the next phase of machine learning AI. How do agencies kind of keep pace with maybe the private sector or internal research and development with how fast these uh, and what's that impact on the people, the the process, and the governance models internally? Yeah, so I, I think you have to. You have to start with the people, right? I mean, I think there's there's no substitute for getting smart folks uh, inside of government. Uh, and those, and the good news is we have a lot of really smart folks in government. And so, how do we make sure that they are uh, uh, keeping current with the latest uh, technical skills, right? Uh, so, how do they um, just in time make sure that they are uh, aware of the right technologies? And so, uh, how do we how do we acquire them? How do we hire them? How do we uh, train them and upskill them? Platforms like Pluralsight. Um, and, and, and how do we make sure that they, they have an opportunity to be fulfilled in, in their careers? Um, there's no substitute for great people in uh, um, technical roles, not just in, in, as um, the CTOs, but also in acquisition. All right, and so I like what Tracy Walker has done with US Digital Service in training uh, contracting officers about how to uh, buy uh, agile software development shops, and so uh, we still custom build a lot of software in government, arguably too much. Um, but if we're gonna do that, let's make sure that we are using the best practices of user-centered design, of um, let's have the, the best uh, groups that can actually build software rather than the groups that can, that can write the best PDF. And I think that's actually a super important point here is that there's so much process involved in acquisition. I love what Harrison was saying about, about uh, um, where the IRS is going, because mm -hmm. we've, we've classically run into this problem of we're gonna write requirements for years, we're gonna procure for years, we're gonna build for years, and then we, we hit an operator in, or a user in year 10, and then even if we got all of that right, and uh, like the chances that you got all that right is very, very low, but then you know technology has moved on, yep. the, the 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 user needs have moved on, the you know all of that stuff has moved on, and so like it's just a recipe for failure. And all the stats out there will tell you just about how big IT projects fail. And so you know how do we break it up into pieces? And that means uh, how do we evaluate technology and how do we decide, hey, we're gonna use this technology versus that technology. Because the, the problem that we're solving may actually still be relevant. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we are writing user stories and, and, and either building or buying uh, a great software against uh, those problem statements, right? Um, but we, we have to find ways to, to look at that technology. And so it's not about who can write the best 90 page PDF that gets submitted to, an, to a contracting mm -hmm. officer. It's about who can show you great technology, and where is that technology scaled in peer organizations? 
And so that's why having really technical people and uh, people who have experience at scale inside agencies as feds matters because you want to know not just what's happening in the Air Force, but you want to know what's happening in IRS and in Bank of America and in Facebook and all these other organizations, right? And so you can understand has this technology worked at scale and how similar is that environment to mine? And so, um, and that's one of the great things about venture capital is venture capital tends to back companies that are product companies that are trying to win at tier one commercial customers, as well as the great federal organizations uh, here today. Is how, staying on that procurement uh, kind of component there, how important is with, as emerging technology uh, is changing, it's very hard to keep up with and, you know, I've been in this space and I'm like an inch deep. Um, but how is how important is it to, for the acquisition and procurement community to communicate and share information and meet and collaborate with the like IT shop? Because it seems like IT has a difficult time keeping up with the change. How does the procurement acquisition side yeah, keep so up I, with that? I love all my acquisition friends uh, and folks that were on the panel, but I fundamentally think that we have to let the business and technical executives drive the decisions and acquisition and procurement has to be a complement and a partner uh, to them because when, when mission executives, when business executives, and when technical executives, when they say, this is the problem that I'm facing and this is what I want to go do, then uh, it's not the place of a contracting officer to say, well, this is uh, sort of equivalent and it's 10% cheaper. Because software is living, breathing stuff uh, great vendors will continue to improve uh, software and their platforms, and so you want to make a bet on a particular platform or a category inside a platform, uh, uh, having done appropriate market diligence, seen the product uh, demoed, talked to peers uh, you know, at, at similar organizations, public and, and, and private. Right? And so having contracting and, and, and procurement say, well, this thing you know, says it's in the same category. No, you want to buy one of the market leaders or one of the market disruptors that really have not just the best tech t today, but are going to continue to innovate in terms of that feature functionality while not locking you in too, right? And mm -hmm. that's the other thing that I know a lot of feds in the room worry about is, is well, wait a second, I don't want to get locked in. And so that's why this conversation of of open APIs, making sure that we have access to the data is super relevant. One of the uh, things that uh, I, we hear, uh, NextGov, we've been covering a lot on AI and there's a lot of stories and it is a, probably the most transformative technology uh, that we've seen in, in a decade, century. Um, and a lot of people are concerned that AI may take jobs away while others think that AI will provide a lot of job opportunity, not just for developers and IT folks, but really to move, uh, like we heard on the last panel, move people to higher value work uh, and decision making. How do you identify, I know Harrison had some, the last panel had some suggestions, but how do you identify from a skill set and work performance, like what are those opportunities that we can automate and move more mission critical work out? Yeah, so I think he's, he's got a nice framework for it and, and some rules of thumb that work, that work for him. Uh, I mean, I think at the end of the day, we want to identify processes that are paper-based, right? Uh, and rather than just taking those and digitizing those and saying, let's actually look, you know, step back and see if we can, can think about a better process. And so Greg was talking about, from the Jake, was talking about you know, paper logs of maintenance. Uh, a lot of what government does is adjudication of case, case management, right? And so a lot of that is, is paper-based and it's not just enough to, to digitize that and say, okay, now I have a digital case management. You know, let's actually think about how we can automate stuff, how we can better predict stuff, how we can say, hey, I mean, think about a lot of what government does is enforcement, especially in the regulatory agencies, which I don't see enough of here. But uh, so how do you better predict who, who you want to actually go enforce. So yes, you can do random inspections, but you also want to, want to have prediction about, hey, this is, this is a entity or organization or a business that is, is likely to be an offender, and so our enforcement arm should be going out and, and doing, and I think that's, I think every agency kind of has some sort of inspection kind of uh, regime. So being able to predict things, I think, is, is super valuable. And how do you, um, when you identify those opportunities, 
how do we kind of re, uh, I know uh, Dominic from Accenture talked a little bit about reskilling and upskilling. How, how do you do that? What are some best practices to, or like, to take those people now that you've automated, you know, 2,000 hours work, worth of man hours, how do you identify like, okay, how do I train this people and what are the skills that they need? Yeah, so not to, not to harp on the Air Force again, but they're, they're setting up, a, and Bill Marion, the, the deputy CIO, has talked publicly about Air Force Digital University and, and you know, how do you bring on-demand training to, to airmen around the globe. Uh, look at DHS, for example. They had a cloud stand-down day where they mm -hmm. basically uh, um, made um, uh, cloud uh, technology available, uh, training uh, using Pluralsight and others to, to make that available so that everyone can, could get smarter on the cloud. Um, look at look at what uh, Kelly um, uh, O'Connor is doing over at the VA around innovating on, on product management. And this is a, another shift. We have too many project managers in government and we're trying to move to more product managers who are you know, intensely focused on user needs and then building and buying the, the, the right emerging tech to service those, those needs. Uh, but she's developing a culture of, of product management and starting some, some courses there. So I think, I think you see some, some pockets of excellence. The, the challenge is how do we do this at scale? I know that uh, Suzette Kent uh, has been talking about the cyber skilling uh, mm -hmm. uh, initiative and has this initial cohort and that's really exciting and promising but how do we do it for 2.1 million feds right and so I think you need the kind of on-demand platforms uh, I think you need things that are leveraging machine learning and AI so that they are tailored and customized uh, um, uh, to the learner um, and not all of these are going to be IT we tend to kind of collapse things to IT mm -hmm. but one of the things if I look at the insight portfolio some of the companies that have been tremendously successful and now are public companies are about democratizing skills right uh, so democratizing analytics and developing a whole culture of analytics. We're going to have a lot more data engineers than we're going to have data scientists. We're going to have a lot more information analysts and data analysts than we have data engineers, right? And so it's that, that pyramid. And we always say, oh, data scientists, yeah, we want more DJ Patels. That's great. Um, but we can, and we are training more data scientists. I am a big fan of data scientists, but we can also think about how do we empower uh, information analysts and data analysts with a culture of analytics and that means they should be able to use the best tools mm -hmm. right and so those are open source tools and commercial tools that they they can easily try and buy and so getting back to what the previous panel was talking about in terms of uh, a, a culture of risk taking right even Jose was talking about that that uh, early on so I, I'm really bullish about the opportunity set uh, if we can democratize uh, among um, so the things don't become just a couple little experts, mm -hmm. right? I think that's that's what's what's dangerous is is if we're really going to do automation and AI at scale, uh, we need to we need to make sure that we are putting modern tools and platforms in the hands of, of, of a lot of federal workers because they have a lot of great ideas and they're doing a lot of cool things. And so um, let's do this at scale. Well, and I think it's I think there are now the technology is you know from a user experience more people can do more things and learn more things. And so one of the things that NextGov's covered, you know, was the OPM study and did some analysis on, you know, the number of IT workforce over the age of 60 compared to under the age of 30. Uh, and the average is five to one. Some agencies like VA are like 19 to one. Pulling it up a level in terms of like long-term uh, workforce development and as technology continues to emerge. Um, how do you look within your organization to determine like what are the skills, how do you evaluate the skills that you have in the workforce that you have and identify people that again could be trained on in an IT environment or to yep. use technology? So some of the some of the best uh, and most talented feds I know are uh, not spring chickens and are in that demographic that you're uh, talking about so I have I have the utmost respect for them uh, but we do have a demographic challenge right of this almost four and a half or five 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 to one uh, and and um, there's a lot of energy and and uh, tech skills in in the younger generations and so we have to figure out ways uh, because we have retirement and, and a whole bunch of other challenges of how do we attract them to federal service right so I am a proud advisor of coding it forward 
Uh, so Coding It Forward was a group of uh, a couple of my undergraduate students at Harvard actually uh, came to me and said, hey, you know, we want to create a federal internship. We, one of them had done their last summer at Uber Engineering, you know, super, super bright, precocious uh, students. And, and yet uh, they looked on USA Jobs and all they could find was a SharePoint implementation. And with all apologies to uh, Microsoft, like that was not what was uh, interesting to them. And so they, they wanted to do some interesting stuff and, and Census was, was nice enough to actually pioneer uh, coding it forward and, and pony it up for 13 uh, data scientists and software developers. And so now uh, Mar Margaret Weicker just, just uh, gave the keynote last week uh, 55 uh, developers, data scientists, designers in six federal agencies. Now that's just 55 and some of them are getting hired and coming into to, to federal service, but we have to think about how do we attract that at massive scale? How do we attract uh, tech talent at massive scale? And I, I think that's totally doable. I mean, we have, we have a great scale, we have great experiences, uh, we have a really important mission. There's, there's so many things that we can attract. We need to make sure that we show them that there's going to be professional development, that there's going to be modern tools and environments that they're going, that they're going, to, going to learn from, from uh, uh, the really wise folks in the room here. So I, I think this is totally doable, um, but we, ha we have to be intentional about it. And so that means we can't have a nine month hiring process, kind of a, a very kind of uh, broken, process in the way that we that we hire feds today. So while we're fixing that process, how do we get the people currently in the federal workforce, maybe in that 30 to 60 range, how do we get them the skill set to understand cloud or, and work in an, you know, a SaaS environment or um, cyber, certainly security skills are in, in much need. Um, what platforms are available or what can we do to, to get those people up to speed? So I'm a huge fan of Pluralsight, uh, which is uh, an insight investment. So Pluralsight is a on-demand tech skills platform that helps you assess uh, um, the tech skills of, of, your, of your workforce and then also helps design the, the, the uh, just-in-time uh, courses for you. And, and, and the great thing about it is it's on-demand. And I think that's to one of the earlier uh, conversations was uh, we're moving from classroom-based training to on-demand training. Mm -hmm. And as I talk to a lot of CIOs and CTOs and CISOs in this room and, and, and across the federal government, they say that their tech workforce has uh, uh, developed uh, outside of the job specifications, right? And so, you, I mean, again, going back to, to the Kessel Run, you had some airmen who were trying to code uh, they didn't necessarily have the military occupational specialty of software developer, which I, I think had been retired and has now come back, uh, thanks, thanks to the Air Force seeing how important software is, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a, a tremendously important thing. Um, and so we have to find ways to um, let feds continue to upskill themselves because they will do it already. They, they go and do master's programs and SES training and technical training and continuing education. So part of it is we have to continue to let them to do that. But instead of saying, well, you're going to get continuing education credits from coming to this conference and listening to us blather on, like let's actually let them get hands-on keyboard training or other kinds of, of skills, skills training that's going to help, help them. Let's but let's give them credit for what they are learning today. And let's also try and steer that. Like, let's, let's be intentional about saying, hey, these are the kinds of cyber or, or data and AI skills that, that we're looking for. And so we're going to incent folks inside the workforce to, to develop those skills and reward those, those folks by giving them greater responsibility, greater compensation, recognition, all of those things. Is there any, uh, any questions from the audience? No, we don't have time for questions from the audience. <laughs> okay, I've been told. Well, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, all your experience and insights on, on this topic, especially around the workforce and how we keep moving that forward. So appreciate your time. Round of applause for Nick, please. <laughs>